want to say that it's great to be around God's people. We have the Church of God. All right. We're not in a building today, but uh, you're certainly building one behind me, so praise the Lord for that. Luke in chapter number 5. A key ingredient to worldwide evangelization is faith. You see, it takes faith for someone to give over and above their tithe to worldwide evangelization. Mm -hmm. right? That's faith. Yep. It takes faith for someone to surrender their life to worldwide evangelization. Yeah. Yep. Evangelizing the lost. Tonight, this afternoon, I'd like to use the example of ordinary men in the pages of the scripture to demonstrate what it is to live a life of faith. Man. Notice with me Luke 5 and chapter number 1, or verse 1. And it came to pass, as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer before the preaching time. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this night or this afternoon, I just ask, Lord, that you'd fill me with your spirit. Lord, that you would allow me to say the things that you'd want me to say and refrain from saying things I ought not to say. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, I grew up a city slicker. I was born in Missouri, but I was raised in Southern California. My dad was in the Air Force, and he was transferred from Bob Noster Air Force Base to uh, March Air Force Base in Marina Valley when I was one years old. So I, I grew up a city slicker's life. I never went hunting, nor did I go fishing until I was 22. When I was 22, I went to a men and boys camp out, and we went fishing. My uh, soon-to-be brother-in-law took me with his dad. And we, we caught fish, and you know what? It turns out that I like fishing. I am a fisherman. I, I think I'm a fisherman. Uh, the last two years we were spending in Minnesota, I got to go fishing a lot, more than I ever done in my entire life. Uh, even in uh, Minnesota, I even had the opportunity to go out something called ice fishing. Now it's even more fun, because on ice fishing, you get to walk on water, and that's a cool thought. Well, I heard about one fellow who went ice fishing for the first time, and he was not having any bites at all. I mean, he was just sitting there and put the uh, bait on the line, and the fish were just sucking it right off. But he noticed there was a professional fisherman that was almost nearby who was just catching them left after right. And so he goes up to him and says, Okay, what's the trick to catching so many fish here out on this lake? The ice fisherman mumbles, Remember, remember. <laughs> What did you say that Thomas asked? He said, M -m 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 -m. I still don't understand you. At that, the ice fisherman takes out his thermos, opens the cap, spits in twice, and says, I said you got to keep the worms warm. Oh. Oh. <laughs> That's a Minnesota joke. <laughs> With that, <laughs> we're going to look at fishermen tonight. But notice, they had equipment. These were commercial fishermen. They used specialized equipment to catch fish. Notice what they had. First of all, they had two ships. Man, if you ever had a biblical principle for getting a second boat, this is it. Hey, they man. had two ships. You hear that? No. <laughs> <laughs> there were two ships or fishing boats brought ashore, one belonging to Simon and Andrew, the other to Zebedee and his sons. Josephus, the first century historian, says there was about 230 of those type of boats on the lake. They were attended by four or five men each. That they were small is also clear from the account commonly given of them. A single large draft of fishes came to uh, endangered them and came nearly to sinking them. You probably heard of the recent ancient Galilean boat, also known as the Jesus boat. It is an ancient fishing boat from the first century A.D. discovered in 1986 on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. 
The remains of the boat was, uh, the di dimensions were 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, with the maximum preserved height of about 4.3 feet. Uh, first appeared during a drought when the waters of the sea receded. It was constructed primarily of cedar planks joined together by peg mortise and tenon joints and nails. The boat is shallow drafted with a flat bottom, allowing it to get very easy to the shore while fishing. However, the boat was composed of 10 different wood types, indicating either there was a wood shortage at the time or that it uh, was made of scrap wood and had undergone uh, extensive and repeated fixes. The boat was rowable with four staggering rowers and also had a mast allowing the fishermen to sail the boat there on that lake or the Sea of Galilee. They had ships, but they also had nets. On the end of one of their nets was a weight tied, and then on the other side a cork would be tied on that end, and so uh, you would uh, put the weighted end on the floor and let the cork rise it to the top, and that's how they would catch their fish. Proper maintenance of these nets were key ingredients. They had to be regularly washed and mended, as we see in scripture that the fishermen did both to maintain their nets. The commercial fishermen today still use the same method of using a net to catch fish as their primary method of getting uh, fish from the water. One Sunday, a Sunday school teacher was talking about Noah's Ark and how God brought two of every kind onto the boat. At the end of the lesson, the teacher asked, Now, Johnny, do you think Noah did a lot of fishing on the ark while out on the sea? No, Johnny replied, I don't think he did. How could he? He only had two worms. <laughs> <laughs> These fishermen had equipment to get the job done. But secondly, they had experience as well. This experience came in two areas. First, it was in a chosen place. A chosen place, the Lake of Gennesaret or Sea of Galilee. It was about 17 miles long and six broad. You know, it could fit inside Drummond Island. It was that small. <laughs> Today we put boats on top of trailers and move them from lake to lake to lake to lake. Minnesota boasts 10,000 lakes. Finland boasts 60,000 lakes. As a fisherman, you can see why Finland is appealing to me. In Bible days, however, once you placed a boat on water, that was it. You're committing to that one spot. You wouldn't take that boat up out of the water, put it on a trailer, and drive it to the next lake over. No, that was it. That was your spot to fish. I'm sure that day after day, they were able to get a more, more understanding of that lake or that Sea of Galilee. They found out where those sea fish liked to gather, at what time of the day they would come up to the surface and feed and things along those lines. They also probably got to know where the rocks in that lake were where they would try to avoid. This past December, uh, my wife and family and I were staying in with my family, in, or my sister in Florida. They took us to a place called Wikiwachi Springs. Mm -hmm. The Wikiwachi Springs are very clear. In fact, it's 99% clarity. That means in six feet of water, you can see the bottom and all the specks floating at the bottom of the, the, the springs there. At one particular location where the water was the clearest, we saw a big black circle. It was a hole that dropped 90 feet down in the ground. Uh, some snorkelers nearby were telling us there's lots of fish here. Bait your hooks and throw them right here, right here, this spot right here. As soon as we put the, uh, the, um, the bait on our lines and cast them out, a fish would catch on. We did this time after time. We could have caught like 20 fish between the two of us, just putting hook on. They were just, uh, as soon as the bait hit the water, those fish would try to grab on and latch onto it. You know, when you know where the fish are, catching them is the easy part. When you know what the fish like, but these men, they fished all night. They knew that lake. They knew where the fish were, yet they caught nothing. These fishermen had expertise in a chosen place, but also they had expertise in a common pattern. You see, net fishermen carefully placed their nets in the into the water as to not disturb the fish. They continue this maneuver until that net faces a semicircular pattern. Then they would leave that net alone. They'd go to another location and put down another net the same way until all their nets were exhausted. And then they would come back to the first net 
make that semicircular uh, net into a full circle and pull the fish out of the water which was inside. Being a commercial fisherman, Peter must have done this process nearly thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times. Amen. He had expertise, and yet that day, he still caught nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. We've seen the equipment of these fishermen. They had two ships and nets. They had expertise. That was their location. They knew all the fishing spots. They, they, they did this process thousands and thousands upon times. But notice they had an encounter. Verse 4 again in Luke chapter 5, it reads, I'm sorry, I'm looking at Luke 6. Okay, here we go, verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. In other words, Peter was saying, you know what, there's no fish in this lake. If there were fish in this lake, we would have caught something. You know, we toiled all the night and caught nothing. Now, can you imagine going fishing and catching nothing? Some of you might be saying, that's my last three fishing trips right there. I caught nothing. <laughs> yeah. Now, several things about this encounter we find. First, Jesus asked Peter to do something that he was accustomed to doing. You know, Jesus didn't tell him to walk on water that day. He didn't tell him to catch a thousand fish. No, he just told him, let down your nets. The same thing he's done thousands upon thousands of times. This means God is not wanting us to do something we are not capable of doing. Amen. You know, right. God does not have something too great that we cannot accomplish. Amen. So what is it that you have that you can use for God? Do you have a life that you can use? Do you have the funds to support missionary endeavors? I once heard a story about a missionary in Africa who received a knock on the door of his hut one afternoon. Answering, the missionary found a native boy there holding a large fish in his hands. The voice said, Missionary, you taught us what tithing is. So here, I brought you my tithe. As the missionary gratefully took the fish, he looked at the young boy and said, Well, here's one fish. Where's the other nine? The young boy responded, Oh, they're back in the river. i got to go catch them right now. <laughs> <laughs> Upon being told by Jesus to let the nets down, you know what Peter does? He responds with his intellect and experience. He said, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. You know, what? usually when God tells us to do something, we respond with our own experience. You know, Lord, yeah. I tried that already. It didn't work. Then Peter says something that most Christians would not have even said at that moment. He said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. You know, I don't think Peter comprehended the command. You know, doing something that he's done thousands upon thousands of times, getting no results as a result of it, but yet he's going to do it once more. I believe this is what faith is. Faith is doing something based upon who asked you to do it. <laughs> Perhaps today you're outside right now here on Drummond Island thinking, how am I supposed to live off 90% of my income? <laughs> How am I supposed to tithe 10%? You might even have a uh, fixed income where you won't get any raises year after year or something along those lines. You might even be having a hard time living 100% of your income right now. But did you know that God in his word asks us to do it? Mm -hmm. He asks us to tithe. Yep. He also promises to provide for every need. Amen. Perhaps today you're even tithing off your income and have a balanced budget with every penny accounted for, knowing where each penny is spent. However, your pastor, who my, I might add is a very generous pastor and been a blessing to us as we've been here, he's invited some snot-nosed young missionary kid headed to Finland asking you to give above your tithe to support missionary endeavors. Amen. 
So you might be thinking to yourself, how in this world is this supposed to happen? Did you know God in his word says this? He says, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Yeah. You know, giving to worldwide evangelization is an investment with a promise. Do you know what that promise is? It's found in Philippians 4, 4, 19. But my God shall Man. supply all your needs yeah. according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yes. That promise is given to people who are giving to missionaries. Yes. Peter was exercising his faith. He was simply letting down the net he had based upon who asked him to do it. But notice what happens after he made that step of faith. Verse 6. It says, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished. astonished. And all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had there brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. You know, simple obedience produces miraculous results. That's right. Peter's response was that of repentance because he placed his own experience and intelligence over the command that was so plainly given to him by Jesus. If you were at the Sea of Galilee that day, having the same experience, fishing all night, it's your job to catch fish, being so empty-handed, and Jesus asked you to cast your net out one more time, is that something you would have done? Would you have been like Peter, or more like James and John? Notice James and John also in the story. Look at verse 7 again. It says, And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. You know, James and John were close enough to hear Jesus' same words to Peter. They had the same opportunity to let down their own nets. In fact, when Jesus says, let down your nets, mm -hmm. he says it in a plural, not a singular. He wasn't just speaking to Peter. He was speaking to everybody there. That's good, bro. Let down your nets. And then verse 10. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. You see, James and John had to experience the joy and the blessings of Peter's blessing. Because they didn't let down their nets. However, Peter was able to experience the full blessing because he simply obeyed. Do you have that faith? Are you simply obeying what's so plainly found in Scripture? Let's bow for prayer, Kathy. Before I pray, as he was preaching, I alerted me to a passage I heard a, pre a preacher preach one time in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 uh, not, not 3 14 in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2 Moses is arguing with God about not being able to do something in verse 2 and the Lord said what is that in thine hand he said a rod so I ask you this the fishermen had the equipment what's in your hand God can use what abilities do you have that God can use and I guess I, I honestly did not tell him to preach on time. I, I said, do what God tells you to do. But let me say this. Psalm 50 and verse 20, or verse 12, verse 10. God says, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. God doesn't need your money. He wants yeah. your heart. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And if he's got your heart, he's got everything else that you have. Yep. Yes. The problem is, is God doesn't have our heart. You're right. Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. Amen. Yep. Thank you for that reminder, brother. Amen. 
God has blessed me immensely. And that's why I want to tell you what the Lord does for this church that people don't see. You guys know what it took for me to move out here. I didn't ask anybody for a single dime to move out here. And I told my wife, we're not asking anybody for anything. We're going to let God provide. And he did. Yep. To the penny, he provided Praise everything we God. needed to make a move Amen. from Spokane, Washington to little old Drummond Island. Amen. And it went Amen. as far as this, and I'll, I'll close after this. I had told my wife that morning, or that, that night as we're getting ready to pull out, I said, let's stop by the ATM. I want to give each of the kids a 20, a, a 20 to just do whatever they want with on this trip. Lord knew what we were going through, what we were doing. My neighbors somehow found out that we hardly talked to. They walk over as we're loading up in the car, hand me an envelope and say, hey, our, your mover told us what you're going to do out there in Michigan. We want to say we're praying for you, and hopefully this will help. You know what they gave me? You already know. Yeah. They gave me three $20 bills. Yeah. That's God. That's God. That is not luck. That is not coincidence. Yeah. That is God. Amen. Amen. And we all have these little stories, and I know the missionaries can can tell it all the time, and he's not that snotty, no. Yeah. <laughs> right? Pray for him. You know how hard that is for a young missionary to get up and oh, yeah. pour his heart out? Yeah. And say, look, can you help us get to the field? Yeah. It's not cheap living in Finland. No. He needs some help. Lord lays it on your heart. Do something this week. Yeah. We have, give it to Jason. I don't want to know what you give. I don't. I'm not going to tell you what to give. What I want is for you to be as close as you can to God so God can do something Amen. with you. What's Amen. in your hand? Yeah. Yep. And maybe $100 from California that comes in because somebody was watching our services online. Yeah. That happened last week. Glory yeah. to God. Oh, and the week before that, 100 bucks came in from Pennsylvania. Glory to God. <laughs> or a church last year from south, from southern Michigan. Yeah, I don't even know the pastor. He just called me up, talked to me, and said, I want to help build your church. And he sent us that $5,000 to help Amen. with this election. Amen. 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 That Amen. is the God that I serve. Amen. 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 God's going to bless you guys. Amen. I know it. Amen. Yes. Sure. Just as these two gentlemen here can tell you all the blessings that God's done for them over the years and taking care of them, they're the reason I can still have the faith that is required because I have examples. Yep. Let's let God deal with us. Ask God, say, God, what do you want me to do this week? Maybe he wants you just to have a better prayer life. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wants you to be faithful to Bible reading. Maybe he just wants you to say, Lord, I just want you to speak to me. Yeah. When's the last time you can say the Lord really got a hold of you? Yeah. That's a sobering thought. Amen. Yes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the message from Brother Whipler. Yeah. Lord, it's just a reminder of all it takes is a little bit of faith. And it just ties in perfectly with Brother Longstreet this morning. Lord, just finally, Lord, when we have that faith in you, we get to that finally point where we can finally say, place our faith and say, okay, here is my faith, Lord. And Lord, we know that faith is an action. It requires us to do something. And Lord, while we're warned not to pray for faith, because you'll test it, Lord, we do ask you to increase our faith. Lord, help us to rely on you and to trust you. You said you own a cattle on a thousand hills, Lord, and that's what we're doing here. Lord, we're meeting outside this building just as these missionaries need funds to get to their field. Lord, we need to get in this building. But until then, Lord, we're going to serve you. We're going to do everything we can to lift your name up here and to glorify you around the world. And Lord, I'm confident you're going to build this church, as you've already shown. Lord, we do petition you for that. We ask that you provide for it. Lord, bless these meetings. Bless the singing that's going to happen. Bless Brother Long when he comes. Lord, be with Brother Whipler, Lord. Provide his needs, Lord. Give him the support that he needs. Lord, we do love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you guys